Uh, the webinar is now live. I will wait for a few minutes for more attendees to come in before doing the introduction, and then we can get moving. I can already see attendees join in. Hello, friends. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Dandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. Uh, let me give you a brief introduction to Be Waste Wise. We uh, started in 2013 with one moderator for our webinars or video panels. We had 12 moderators in 2022 who came from all over the world. Uh, together, they're posing questions, teasing out insights, and guiding conversations that are more relevant to us than those in other online and offline spaces. And uh, over the years since 2013, more than 300 contributors have also taken part in this journey. Uh, so thanks a lot for your support. Uh, thanks a lot for being part of our webinars. And today we have uh, Cole Rosengren, who's a senior editor at Base Dive, moderating the webinar. Cole has moderated other webinars for us. So please head to the video panel section of our website to uh, see them. The topic for today's webinar is how U.S. cities are pursuing and measuring zero waste goals. We have Gary Liss, Vice President of Zero Waste USA, uh, is one of the speakers, and Natasha Dyer, Acting Executive Director and Program Manager of Sweep Standard, is the other speaker. We've received a lot of your questions, which have been passed on to the speakers. And uh, they will address your questions during the conversation. And over and above, if you have other questions, please feel free to use the Q&A section. If there's just stuff that you want to comment about, please use the chat. Over to you, Cole. Great. Thank you very much for offering us this forum, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. And thanks, of course, to Gary and Natasha for being with us today as well. Um, to start out, I think we'll just do a few minutes for each of you to share a bit more with the audience about your background and your work in this area. Um, Gary, we'll start with you. You, of course, have a robust experience in the space. Can you tell folks a bit about some of the highlights of what you've worked on here and um, what are some of your current focus areas in terms of zero waste progress and measurement in the US? Sure, um, I've been working on zero waste um, since uh, 1997 when first organized a, a session at the National Recycling Congress on zero waste businesses, uh, highlighting uh, businesses that had already diverted 90% of the materials from waste from uh, landfills and incineration and um, uh, help develop the uh, uh, agenda for the new millennium uh, that was uh, issued by the California Resource Recovery Association. And uh, uh, that called for uh, zero waste as the new direction to be pursuing. Um, I've been a consultant on my own since 1998 as Gary Listen Associates. I do a lot of work with uh, Rick Anthony and Ruth Abbey as zero waste associates. and. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm uh, Vice President of Zero Waste USA. I'm the Certifications Director for the Zero Waste International Alliance. And I work primarily on zero waste plans for communities, businesses, and institutions. Uh, currently working in uh, NYU on a procurement of their new solid waste and recycling system. Did one similarly for Boston University uh, recently. and. Uh, and that followed uh, having worked on the Boston Zero Waste Plan. Those are a couple of highlights. Got it. Well, thank you. Um, and Natasha, how about you? What uh, your, if correct me if I'm wrong, now director fully of Sweep, right? Yeah. Uh, drinking Congratulations. Well. Thank you very much. Just trying to keep up. Yeah. So my name is Natasha Dyer. Uh, thanks for uh, letting me join you all for this opportunity to talk about zero waste. Um, but yeah, so before coming to Sweep, I actually spent the, almost the last decade working on organics waste diversion from landfill as part of municipal and state level climate action plans. Uh, I worked for a solid waste environment consultancy, um, and I worked for a waste hauler, and then just most recently I'm uh, finishing working out of a city's mayor's office of sustainability, and now for the last um, few months I've been working with Sweep and very happy and very inspired to be now work working on the entire waste stream to try to figure out more ways that Sweep can help the industry champion uh, sustainable materials management um, goals and trying to make sure that their operations are circular and sustainable. Um, would you like me to tell you more about Sweep or? Let's sure, see. yeah, I think it would be helpful for the audience in oh. case they're not familiar. Excellent, yeah. So Sweep um, actually stands for Solid Waste Environmental Excellence uh, Performance Standard. And we're uh, actually a rating system that incentivizes local governments and their solid waste handlers to go through a third party certification that verifies that their entire operation is circular and sustainable. 
So um, like what kind of policies are municipalities creating to make sure resources skip the landfill and are then put back into markets at higher use? Are they banning organic from landfills so as not to create a harmful green gas, uh, greenhouse gases and then to create instead create wonderful compost that goes right back into our soil? And then um, are they doing things like creating ordinances that value the resources that are found in the built environment so that instead of working crews uh, for old buildings, now you're seeing jobs and markets be created by dismantling buildings methodically and purpose purposefully and more material ends up back in the economy. And another example of some sustainable solutions um, for waste handlers is like, so if you're a, a landfill, are you, and there are already organics in your landfill because we haven't quite hit that organics diversion bill, are you uh, capturing landfill gas and using it to power your buildings or city fleet? So this is some of the work we do, um, this rating system that determines um, how well city, cities are doing with their zero waste and then incentivizing them to do better. Thank you for a little preview of that. There's a lot to measure and a lot to keep track of. Um... And that's along those lines for both of you, and maybe start with you on this, Gary. How 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 far have we seen cities progress in the US? It's of course a spectrum and zero waste is something that is it's not a one-time achievement and then you're done. It's an ongoing process. But what what are some of the the highlights that you've seen, Gary? And then to you, Natasha, on progress here. Well, uh, fundamentally, uh, cities are at the forefront of uh, implementing zero waste in uh, the United States, particularly. Uh, and in Europe, um, um, there's over uh, 400 cities that have uh, um, joined the Zero Waste Cities program of Zero Waste Europe uh, that uh, is a really robust uh, resource uh, for cities all over Europe pursuing this. Uh, in the United States, uh, over 100 cities have uh, adopted Zero Waste as a goal and are working towards it. Uh, some of the best successes include San Francisco, um, uh, Los Angeles, um, uh, San Jose, Palo Alto. Uh, Palo Alto, we did a zero waste plan recently, uh, an update of their zero waste plan because they had already achieved most of the goals of the original zero waste plan back in 2005. And um, um, they're now at about 80, over over 80% 80 uh, waste diversion. Uh, there are several other cities in California over 80% uh, diversion. Uh, so cities are uh, progressing very well. Uh, at ZWIA, the Zero Waste International Alliance, we adopted a zero waste declaration uh, in 2020, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And in honor of that, wanted to highlight some of the key provisions of what zero waste means. Um, and um, if you go to the zwia.org, zwia.org website, uh, you'll see the uh, declaration uh, highlighting center equity, envisioning a just and inclusive system resulting on sustainable and regenerative future, advocating for policies and practices that ensure human safety, equitable access to resources and opportunities, and elimination of toxins and pollution that negatively impact ecological ecological health. It also goes into redesign, ba banning uh, wasteful products. Uh, zero Waste is all about uh, focusing first on uh, upstream, on the rethinking, redesign, refusing uh, materials that are be go going to become uh, wasted. Um, we look to make producers responsible for problem uh, products, and we're making great strides on that with the four state laws that have been adopted for problem uh, packaging uh, in the United States in recent years, uh, separating at the source, rescuing food and uh, composting organics, uh, supporting and expanding repair and reuse, building the infrastructure for zero waste, ending welfare for wasting of uh, the subsidies for resource extraction um, and advocating and adapting uh, all those approaches as needed. We have a variety of tools that have been used to develop zero waste plans for both communities and businesses and institutions now. And uh, those help implement those um, ideas of the declaration that most zero waste communities are striving for and progressing on. Gotcha, thank you for giving us some of those examples there. Um, Natasha, is there anything you'd wanna add on that or perhaps any thoughts on how cities are working on this, but maybe earlier in the process, I'm sure you deal with some of those cities in the sweet process. 
Um, well, yeah, um, I was just also going to talk about like, I guess, just just I guess what's exciting about zero waste is just the fact that like you're starting to see the world really get involved with this right I mean businesses consumers are like and that there are consumers like this push is really coming overall from consumers like worldwide there's something like 2000 groups global globally that work on just the plastic issue alone and so we're not going to get there until we start to more put this push on um industry that's making this this problem right because we we know facts that like uh, something like 20 companies are responsible for 55% of the plastic waste and 100, 100 companies responsible for 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. So um, I guess looking at the government side that SWEEP works in, we're starting to see them now want to actually start to figure out ways to um, uh, have third-party verification that they are actually being more sustainable with their, um, their discards and making sure that they skip the landfill. Gotcha. Um, along those lines, and we have a question coming in from the, the the chat about this, and also something we wanted to talk about as well. How to how to define this, right? There's as you you've mentioned a couple of them, Gary. There's some international definitions. There's various things out there, but city to city, county to county, their metrics are not often comparable. The term diversion may appear in one, reduction in the other. How do we wrap our arms? around this, and I'll kick this to either of you. I, I want to spend a little time on this working through this question. Yeah, on, on the uh, definition of zero waste um, and, and um, uh, what, what are we talking about, uh, the declaration highlighted some of the uh, concepts, but the, uh, um, the Zero Waste International Alliance was formed in 2002 to do just that, to set the standards of what zero waste uh, uh, should be. Uh, uh, viewed as um, how it, it could be implemented. So we adopted the uh, uh, first uh, definition of zero waste in the world um, that was internationally um, uh, peer reviewed um, uh, all over the world through the uh, uh, leaders of the zero waste movement uh, back in 2004. That was updated in 2018 to emphasize that what we really don't want to do is burn and destroy these resources uh, that are being discarded. Um, we uh, set up the hierarchy of highest and best use to guide people on what types of things they should be pursuing. And if you go to zwia.org backslash ZWH, you can get to the four-page document that gives both principles and, and a hierarchy of how to pursue, rethink, reduce, and reuse first before you recycle and compost. Um, and uh, we've developed uh, tools um, with the uh, uh, Zero Waste USA, uh, Zero Waste Community Toolkit, uh, that includes a checklist of about 100 different uh, policies, programs, and infrastructure that could or should be uh, considered by communities based on best practices around the world. Uh, we also developed just this year a similar toolkit for zero waste businesses and institutions. Um, again, which is really helpful. Uh, the zero waste community uh, planning checklist was actually the beginning of an outline for the EPA website called Managing and Transforming Waste Streams, which uh, uh, provides 100 different uh, policies programs uh, for moving towards zero waste. And on that, uh, there's over 350 um, models, examples of uh, getting to um, uh, zero waste. Um, so those are some of the uh, tools and uh, principles that are out there. We've also developed business principles, community principles, recognition guidelines. All of those tools are posted at zwia.org. Um, and um, um, the, the most important thing for people to take away is, is, is if you see zero waste to landfill, zero landfills, landfill free, or no landfills, that's a clue that they're burning a lot of material. It's <laughs> the wrong definition of zero waste. And when we're talking about zero waste, we're talking about no burning. And um, uh, we don't want to bury the resources either but it's really about not um, investing in these capital intensive um, uh, burners that uh, require constant feedstock, which means you cannot get out of them or you pay for uh, uh, put or pay contracts uh, uh, to continue to um, 
uh, use the facility. Got it. So it sounds like great. That's the Zwia definition. And that's what, you know, and we have seen a number of cities in the US take that approach, right, to to uh, emphasize not not using the incinerator. Um, it can still seem tricky, at least for us, we at Waste Dive attempted last year to kind of map it all out and figure out of the top cities who who's making the most progress, where are they? And they're, at least as far as I can tell, there's not really a good way to compare across cities because everyone counts it a little differently. Every city or county government maybe handles one service and not the other. Um, Natasha, with some of the work on sweep, could there be a future where we can standardize and compare at all? Or is that uh, too complicated, perhaps? No, actually. Um, so just just to the um, comments about whether, I guess, cities um, um, can measure their progress based on the uh, on the current metrics and systems. And just to what you're saying, it's it's just really impossible because there are no common definitions or metrics. Everyone makes up their own rules and declares victory using very different criteria, right? So um, this really is happening because there's no standardized waste characterization study used industry-wide with the same definitions of even what a plastic bottle is. So they're not getting a true view of what's being diverted. But at Sweep, um, this is one of the key pillars of the work we do. We are setting out to clearly define industry terms, creating a standard and definitions. How's the industry defining its discards before they begin to tell you how much they're diverting, standardize the terminology, the terminology in those waste characterization, characterization studies? Because I mean, like even like I, I always like to think of our organics, like the way people, or excuse me, cities are diverting um, their organic waste. Like for some cities, that means yard trimmings. And then for some cities, um, that actually means the, uh, the co-mingling of yard trimmings with their food waste and so on and so on. All these different definitions of the way even plastic bottles are called out. Some On some characterizations, you'll see rigid or some you'll say one to seven and they're um, compiling all those one to seven in one metric, right? For some cities are doing one and two and three and four. So because there's no standardization in how people are actually um, defining what they're measuring, there's all it's just all over the place. And some cities are doing very well, even though I think, um, or or the way they they the way they created their um, their definitions that makes them do well, even though I think the United States hasn't gotten over thirty five percent in recycling a, as a whole, right? So some cities look very well, even though they're doing better than them. In some cities, it's just in their um, criteria. And so that's what Sweep is trying to do. Like that's that's really the, a lot of the basis is us trying to determine um, ways that we can define what we're all looking at so that we can be measuring the same. And that's how you that's the standard we're creating. Gotcha, Gary. I, 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 I'd like to I'd like to chime in that the um, you know, seeing in the chat the reference to not meeting uh, higher standards. Uh, thousands of businesses have already diverted over 90% of their uh, waste from landfills, incinerators, and the environment, as documented by ZERI, the Zero Emissions Research in Initiatives of uh, Gunter Pauli. Uh, hundreds of cities around the world have done it. We're at the cutting edge of this movement. Um, uh, the average doesn't define us. It's the goals and principles that define us. Uh, so just because the average... Uh, 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 recycling rate in uh, America is, is uh, stuck at uh, in the low 30 percent doesn't mean that zero waste isn't working. Zero waste is working. Uh, we do have 80 percent diversion uh, cities in Europe, in the United States. Um, uh, they may not be uh, uh, lots of uh, cities, uh, but they are showing us uh, the way forward. Um, so getting stuck on the 32% definition of, of uh, where our recycling rate in America is for the entire country, sure, um, that's that's uh, disappointing. Uh, but but um, that's where you, you need to find the leaders and, and follow the leaders. They're showing us the way to zero waste. No, I'm point taken. And then the EPA data, right, is based on modeling and has, has been questioned by Waste Business Journal and Yale and others may not be 100% on point either, right? It's hard to get a national picture in part because there's not a good standardized yet local and county and state picture. You know, it's all complicated. Um, kind of building off this measurement idea, and to your point, Gary, about following the leaders and looking what's next, are you seeing any cities move away from using the term diversion or having diversion goals in favor of reduction? Seattle comes to mind for me in the past year or so, if I'm not mistaken. They said, hey, we want to focus a little more on reduction because you could just keep producing the same or more amount of waste and divert more of it, but not kind of meet the principles of the hierarchy, right? 
Yeah, uh, Zero Waste International Alliance definitely encourages uh, uh, that focus on reduction uh, rather than diversion. Um, uh, diversion is a common metric, particularly in the United States. Um, uh, so I'm not sure that we'll get away from that. We'll probably need a variety of measures. Um, one of the things we stress in zero waste, it's not just about the tonnage uh, diverted. Uh, that's only one of the measures of performance. Uh, one of the most important ones is the reinvestment of resources back into local economy, highlighting the number of jobs that can be created. Um, um, in um, zero waste, if you have 10,000 tons of materials discarded, and, and you burn or bury that, you get one or two jobs. If you uh, compost it, you get four jobs. If you recycle it, you get 10 jobs. And if you reuse it, you get 75 to 250 jobs as documented by the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Um, so it's about uh, the, you, the productive use of those resources and not using resources in the first place. That, that's what Rethink and Reduce is all about. Zero Waste we, was, was, was first promulgated in order to get people going beyond recycling, to think upstream, uh, that uh, recycling is the last resort. Uh, we've got to rethink, redesign our products, our systems, um, uh, so we're not wasting in the first place. Got it. Along those lines, and this could go to either of you, you know, are there types of programs or, or structures that we've seen make progress on that? Some people prefer, you know, um, pay as you throw or save as you throw as one example, or other kind of incentives or fee structures that will either give people a credit for having lower waste volumes or, you know, make it less expensive to do composting or recycling than landfill bound waste. Um, any trends to call out there that either of you are seeing lately? Well, if I can, yeah, I, 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 I'm someone that stands completely behind pay as you throw. I mean, for, for what I can see, because I think it's the single most effective educator on waste diversion and recycling um, that you can create actual behavior change with people more than a bin decal or a billboard. If you're increasing fees on garbage while keeping recycling and composting fees lower, um, this incentivizes waste reduction and encourages residents to pri prioritize recycling and composting, right? Just by that, by that, how they're, how it hits their, their pocketbook, because now they're seeing like, oh, um, if this goes in this can, now I'm paying for it. I think it's just very, it's very clear. Um, and also, um, like there's a really good uh, uh, case study that was done uh, over Gainesville, Florida, that they showed that when they rolled off their pay, pay as you throw model, they were able to report a reduction in almost 18% um, of their solid waste and they saved their residents 200,000. I think there's a um, an equity case you made too, because I know some people think that like, oh, well, if you're now starting to um, uh, put more of a, a economic or excuse me, like an economic hardship on that trash can, you're actually teaching people to recycle less because many older generations grew up conserving this materials. So this can be an advantage as well. They'll know kind of what they should be doing. And just personally, like um, my, my waste um, bill goes up every year, but I probably roll out my can every two months because I'm actually recycling and composting. So I tend to think pay as you throw is a good uh, rollout system for for cities and counties, just because it's literally it teaches people what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I totally agree. Pay as you throw is a, a key tool. Over uh, nine thousand communities in America have uh, adopted pay as you throw. There's lots of different ways of structuring that, um, but the uh, uh, the use of incentives uh, residentially like that for uh, um, uh, makes sense for businesses. Uh, um, EPA called, uh, developed a system called resource management uh, back in the 2000 period by TELUS Institute in Boston. Um, and resource management was all about changing the economics so that your hauler uh, is paid for hauling, not necessarily for waste, uh, taking away your waste. And so by having integrated contracts um, uh, that give savings to both the hauler and the, uh, uh, the generator, uh, you're you're uh, getting um, uh, um, harnessing the forces of the marketplace to achieve your goals. Uh, other things that do that um, are highlighted in our zero waste declaration. Uh, the bans, um, uh, such as uh, Massachusetts, has adopted about 15 different product bans uh, from landfills, uh, many of which um, have been well implemented uh, around the state and. Uh, uh, in California, we we uh, we call for don't ban without a plan, 
Uh, so they need to be uh, carefully Im implemented. Uh, but the bands are a very powerful tool for getting uh, people to focus on uh, uh, wasteful products and wasteful systems. Um, separating at the source is, is probably one of the most important tenets of uh, zero waste that's in our declaration. And um, the way you get uh, uh, materials um, recycled and composted right, uh, correctly, uh, is by keeping it as clean as possible along the way by separating it where it's uh, being generated. And um, uh, after redesign, uh, that's probably one of the most important uh, principles. And then um, making producers responsible for their problem products, um, um, uh, that needs to be more of a partnership going forward. Um, uh, we got into this mess because of the exponential increase in, in products that the municipal waste system wasn't designed to handle. And uh, um, we, we need to internalize those externalities that uh, have been foisted on our system by people not having um, uh, any controls over them. In, in nature, when, when you see something going at an exponential rate, it means it's out of control. And that's what's happened with our system. Uh, we need to put the controls in place. Uh, we're not against industry. We, we strong uh, support for economic development and, and public-private partnerships. Uh, but we need uh, uh, regulations and rules to guide the system back into uh, a balance, which it's out of balance now. And I also wanted to, uh, thank you, Gary, I also wanted to make a nod at those um, right to repair laws that are coming out in some cities. Like I know uh, New York's governor uh, just earlier this year uh, put together a law that was allowing people and moms and pop, moms and pops um, uh, fix it shops to actually be able to uh, be privy or, or get that proprietary information from, um, um, I guess, manufacturers that are holding that. And so then people got to actually Throw that product away but so i think laws like that should should have more should come along more i know you get credit and sweep for that type of um for for doing that type of law in your city so things like that are helping zero waste um policies as well or, or more diversion from landfills as well that's a good point right rates repair is starting to catch on minnesota just passed as well and um california has a bill that is still pending so we'll know more by the fall on that um Thank you to everyone who's been putting questions in the Q&A box. We encourage others to do the same. Uh, we'll take one of those. It kind of builds a bit off something you were mentioning, Gary, but maybe either of you have further thoughts on this. Um, reducing contamination. You mentioned, Gary, you view source separation as a key way to do that in areas where perhaps the system isn't set up that way or they are not inclined to change back to maybe how they used to have it. Are there any other kind of educational or you know community tactics that seem to be working well to encourage people to, to follow the guidelines here. Sure, the uh, Recycling Partnership has done amazing work in documenting how to accomplish that in a very um, um, cogent manner. If you look at um, uh, community-based social marketing, uh, a lot of what the Recycling Partnership is uh, advocating is all about that, where you're defining what is the problem, um, uh, exploring different options, what the best message is to communicate that, and then um, uh, doing a very targeted campaign uh, to address these specific uh, contaminants for your system. We don't have one recycling system in America. We have uh, thousands of recycling systems. So uh, it's a confusing arena uh, to be dealing with. Uh, to address that, uh, you need to have um, locally um, um, efforts that, that help people understand that complexity in the simplest way possible. Massachusetts has the Recycle Smart program, which uh, RecycleSmartMA.org, uh, or I think it's .org, uh, is um, an example of um, uh, putting together some of those principles from the Recycling Partnership and in Massachusetts, they even have a dividends program where if communities do the right things to keep things separate, the state helps fund those initiatives. Um, uh, so that's a great model to be uh, uh, following. Uh, the Colorado uh, Front Range Waste Diversion Program, known as FORWARD, 
uh, is now spending millions of dollars um, um, in grants uh, and technical assistance uh, to communities to help them figure out what are the uh, the best ways to um, to address contamination, to to um, maximize source separation. Uh, we just did a, a zero waste plan in Broomfield, Colorado, funded by that forward program, uh, which which um, uh, enabled the city of Broomfield uh, to uh, uh, spend a lot of effort to uh, work with stakeholders in the community to identify what are the problem areas, what are their concerns, how to address them, and that was put together in a comprehensive zero waste plan. Some helpful examples. Um, Natasha, is there anything else you'd want to add or anything about how SWEEP is, you know, trying to quantify or, or value educational efforts that cities may be doing? Well, that's actually um, one of our performance categories. You can't get points without having a, a education program to for your constituents to know how to reduce their waste from the source, actually. So that's that's one of our one of our one of our pieces. Gotcha. Okay. Um, turning to another question that we received here, um, how did the pandemic affect all, all these efforts, all this progress? It's quite complicated, as we all know, but um, it certainly did slow things down in some cities, at least temporarily. Um, anything either of you would want to call out on that? Well, the worst thing was the proliferation of single-use products. Um, um, supply shortages, employee shortages. Um, but generally, zero waste uh, kept going. Um, uh, after some initial flurry uh, promoted by the plastics industry that everything had to be single use, uh, there were many studies that documented reusable systems were actually better from a, a sanitation standpoint because they were meeting uh, commercial sanitation standards when uh, reusing uh, products like takeout uh, food containers. And uh, we had a, a huge uh, uh, development of new innovations in the uh, reusable foodware arena uh, during the uh, pandemic uh, because everyone coalesced um, uh, with the leadership of the uh, National Reuse Network of Upstream um, uh, really led the way on that and uh, brought together hundreds of people uh, from uh, hundreds of communities around the country uh, to pioneer uh, new uh, uh, services for reusable foodware, and that's being implemented uh, significantly uh, now. Um, there's strong, through the pandemic, there's been strong congressional support uh, because concurrent with the pandemic was um, the, the recognition by the media of the plastics pollution problem. And that has catapulted uh, zero waste in the forefront of how to address the plastic pollution problem, uh, led by the Break Free from Plastics Network uh, in, in uh, America and around the world, and many other organizations like Greenpeace and env environmental activist groups highlighting that uh, uh, this pollution was going on. So during the pandemic, concurrent with it, was the recognition by the media of uh, this being a problem. And, and we've got more bills in Congress now than we've had in decades. I, I've been in the business over uh, 45 years, and uh, there's been nothing like this uh, uh, before. And we're, we're, um, we're starting to see um, a, a significant results coming out of that through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act funding billions of dollars, uh, once in a generation uh, opportunity uh, to uh, build the infrastructure we need uh, to um, uh, reduce more, reuse, recycle, and compost. Gotcha. And I'm glad you mentioned the congressional funding. We'll, we'll follow up on that briefly here to get more details for folks. Um, Natasha, what have you seen? As Gary mentioned, there certainly has been a lot of federal funding, though in the beginning, before that came, municipalities were dealing with budget challenges as well. What, what's been kind of the, the wash for sweep cities here? Well, during the pandemic, actually, I was employed with the city of Atlanta, Mayor's Office of Sustainability, and the area of funding I was able to see immediate federal research and funding that uh, came to our city was in waste reduction around food at the farmer level um, to curb food loss. And so before COVID in the US, um, you may know, we already lose something like 9 million tons of food on the farm floor annually. 
and all this is due to overproduction or cosmetic issues. But during COVID, this number went up exponentially, and this was due to the fact that um, really the largest customer of most farmers is the food sector. And so food is grown and packaged and sold in enormous quantities, you know, um, uh, think like going to your restaurants and your hotels and your hospitals and your schools. And um, just think that like restaurants are um, by 40% of all the onion sales that, that, that actually these farmers are um, producing. And so with COVID um, messing up that supply chain, um, are they able to change their, their plans on a dime? No, they weren't. And so a lot of that food was just going to waste because like to actually harvest it and then put it through the supply chain, that's not only um, environmentally damaging, it's actually more expensive. So this kind of um, um, influx of money that we were able to see was, we saw the um, EPA region four coming in and choosing the city of Atlanta to work on a program called Farm to Neighborhood Surplus Food Project. And basically this was um, helping us in our, our goals of feeding our low income and low insecure residents. And we were able to um, um, uh, help farmers with a shared revenue project that was allowing them to load food up into an app called Forcher. And then those neighborhood corner stores in those areas where people were like actually really um, aren't living within half a mile of, of fresh and for affordable produce, those corner stores were able to buy past the broker and then purchase that produce at a discount discounted rate and sell into their communities. So that's that was some interesting um, 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 influx of um, money that we saw from the EPA during that time, during that um, COVID breakage in systems. Interesting. No, and I think it, what we saw, you know, just in our reporting as well, is there were some initial, you know, delays, so to speak, and maybe implementing certain state or city laws or, you know, uh, budgets temporarily affecting programs, but things have largely come back around now in part because, as you both have mentioned, a lot of federal money coming in unprecedented, as I think you described, Gary, um, we did receive an advanced question about this. Someone seemed to indicate uh, it's almost uh, too much to manage for cities in terms of either the dollar amounts or the number of grant opportunities. It's hard for maybe cities to wrap their head, their, you know, just have the resources to apply for further resources. Um, anything either of you would want to add on what, what has been working or any advice for cities on how to kind of approach making the most of this federal opportunity? Yeah, the, the um, <clears throat> federal government has recognized that, uh, particularly in the environmental justice uh, grants arena, they've actually set up 17 centers around the country uh, to work with community-based organizations that are a prime target for a lot of the federal funding uh, to help them um, develop their capacity to get additional grants. Uh, the EPA Brownfields uh, program is probably a, a great example where uh, your first step into the realm of funding through the Brownfields program is technical assistance. Uh, so you apply for technical assistance, you get into the track on that. They help you figure out uh, what your needs are, what the availability of funds are, and then help you apply for uh, grants. Um, and um, uh, the reuse corridor of uh, West Virginia uh, is probably one of the, uh, the better examples that I've seen in recent years where they've cobbled together a whole variety of federal and state um, uh, uh, grant programs to help fund their, their uh, initiatives, including Economic Development Administration grants and uh, uh, EPA grants uh, to uh, 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 pull together millions of dollars of investment and uh, reuse infrastructure in, in uh, West Virginia. Um, uh, it's probably not a coincidence that uh, a, a key congressional leader uh, from West Virginia is uh, Senator Joe Manchin. Uh, and uh, it reminds me of uh, the fact that earmarks are back. Uh, so if you're looking for uh, help in getting federal money, don't forget your congressional representatives. Uh, they will work with you and they will work with uh, uh, the agencies to make sure that your project is is heard and seen and funded. Um, uh, so uh, work work with your congressional leaders, uh, both the House representatives and the U.S. senators. Um, uh, they can earmark, which means uh, specify a particular project in congressional legislation that they want to see funded. And uh, that that system had uh, gone away for many years. It's back, 
and it's probably going to be one of the most helpful tools for uh, local communities to find their way through the maze of funding that's that's around here. But developing the capacity uh, is definitely something the federal government understands is a problem. Um, some of the grant proposals are a lot easier than others uh, to uh, apply for. Um, Jay Bassett, who's on the National Recycling Coalition board with me, uh, stressed that uh, uh, the Brownfields program is a one-page application uh, and, and uh, uh, probably the, one of the easier ways into the system and uh, encourage people to uh, avail themselves of that. Interesting. So, Natasha, anything you'd want to add on that that you're seeing in cities? And is that for, um, is the question about how the influx of federal funding would help the work that we're doing. I'm sorry. I think yeah, how it would help and how how cities can you know make prioritize so to speak. But if you can speak to anything, that'd be great. Yeah, and it's interesting that like it's it's sweep focus. My thought process because a lot of what we're thinking about for sweep is kind of taking up the mantle and not doing this kind of incremental change in each city. So basically, all that funding that's being represented in the uh, bi bipartisan infrastructure law and the inflation reduction acts. Um, um, well, because Sweep's approach to solving the solid waste problem is a system-wide change and not a continued propping up or funding of these little incremental changes, like I was saying, we're kind of wishing that the EPA would look at us as a standard to kind of come through and help um, solve all of these problems. Because like we've mentioned, like the cities aren't connected, like uh, Gary Liss mentioned, there's thousands of different types of recycling programs. So um, a, like, if, is because there are 89,000 local governments in our, our country, like if the EPA just kind of used us as a standard, the same way they've got their Energy Star standard that um, they use to measure energy and efficiency in buildings, once the sweep standard comes along, we have this um, standard that can reshape the solid waste industry. So that's kind of my take on, on the way funding uh, would help zero waste um, uh, further is because Sweep is trying to create a standard that can actually standardize the entire system. If that makes sense. And, yeah. and standards and certification programs are are a really a great tool that uh, we've seen um, uh, advance uh, the whole industry, um, bring, uh, bringing everyone up to the standard. And um, uh, for businesses, it's been particularly important because businesses are trying to um, demonstrate that they're uh, not greenwashing, that they're doing the right stuff. So they go and try and find out, well, what is the right stuff? <laughs> and it's the standards programs and the certification and recognition programs um, that they find as uh, some of the, uh, the best tools um, uh, going out there. On the grants, there's one thing else I wanted to mention. Uh, right now, uh, it's really important for communities in America to get involved with the development and climate action plans, which are being developed at the state level and by MSAs, Metropolitan Statistical Areas. There's uh, about 70 uh, Metropolitan Statistical Areas that are targeted to get funds under the Inflation Reduction Act, about $4.6 billion. And uh, um, materials management is an eligible activity uh, under the federal law, but it needs to be included in the local MSA or state climate action plans in order to avail themselves of that $4.6 billion or part of it. Um, so compared to the SWIFR programs and the Rio programs at EPA, this dwarfs that. Um, uh, SWIFR meaning the Solid Waste Infrastructure for Recycling um, a Program and Rio, the Recycling Education and Outreach Grants that a lot of people focused on. Those are by no means the only grants. Uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, is doing a lot of work in uh, composting grants like uh, Natasha alluded to in her uh, uh, Atlanta work, uh, the uh, uh, U.S. Department of Energy is doing a lot of work with plastics. Um, uh, the U.S. Economic Development Administration, um, uh, there's job opportunities here, folks, with uh, all of the zero waste initiatives. And EDA wants your projects. To, they want to fund those projects uh, as an economic development uh, tool for uh, urban and uh, rural areas. Um, so right now is the time to get involved with your state agencies to make sure that they're 
including materials management in their climate action plans and for uh, participating with the uh, almost 70 uh, metropolitan statistical areas at a more local level. Uh, they're developing climate action plans as well to access that $4.6 billion of uh, Inflation Reduction Act funding for these sustainability initiatives. Yeah, that's help, a good, helpful context. And as you say, yeah, these other agencies, not just EPA, and we see examples a lot of local organics programs getting funding from USDA to help launch or state programs. And I, and I wanted to say too, sorry, excuse me, um, that there's a lot of funding for community-based organizations. That's a lot of, a lot of this funding has got to flow through those organizations. And so cities, are, it, it behooves them to try to figure out who's doing the local composting, who's doing the, uh, the deconstruction, who's doing, who's reselling that, those, those resources, because a lot of cities are, it's, I think it's the Justice 40, there's this environment, exactly. this EJ, uh, environmental justice piece to it, where they actually want to prop up these businesses that are already doing this work, because then that helps uh, the jobs pieces and then in the neighborhood and actually helps the communities do better. So they're not just looking for cities to solve all of the problems anymore. They want the cities to work in conjunction with these organizations or the, these community-based assets, I believe is another term for it, that are already in the community, employing people in the community and solving some of their, their um, zero waste um, prices already. And so the city, that's where a lot of the funding is flowing is through these, you've got to pair with um, community-based assets. And so we're trying to figure out a lot of that as well. Um, and just and Justice 40 it, uh, means that 40% of all these uh, federal funding initiatives are to go to disadvantaged communities, which include urban, rural, tribal, and um, those who have been underserved heretofore. Um, so it's basically uh, anyone who's uh, 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 needs need support um, should be able to get it, uh, but it's they're, the federal government environmental justice initiatives coming out of both the White House and the EPA Environmental Justice Advisory Councils are stressing community-based organizations as partners. So what that translates for communities is that if you're partnering with community-based organizations, you'll have a better chance at getting more of the money that you're applying for. So work together and you get more. It's killing two birds with one stone, right? Yeah, so that's the whole look of it. Instead of trying to have cities keep solving the problem, let's go into the communities and have them and fund their work so they can solve the, the problems that cities are having. So mm -hmm. yeah, good idea. No, this yeah. is all great info for the, for the folks, especially those working in cities. Um, Along those lines, as you say, you know, environmental justice and equity uh, uh, priority for the White House. We're hearing it more, you know, as a federal and, and certain states priority. Um, any examples of, you know, city policies that cities themselves can take on or how they may be integrating these concepts into their own zero waste plans these days? Anything either of you are seeing on that? As far as the federal grants integrating them, I'm sorry, I should have been more specific in terms of just in terms of cities advancing their own, ensuring their zero waste plans uh, incorporate equity and environmental justice at the local level, not from a funding standpoint, just from in terms of their operations and their goals. Yeah, uh, a Baltimore Fair Development Plan for zero waste um, is probably our best example of work that we've done in this uh, field. Uh, we were lead on that project. Um, and uh, in Baltimore, um, um, they have a lot of the uh, community was not getting regular recycling service, uh, much, much less uh, being served um, uh, for some of the uh, zero waste initiatives. So uh, a key emphasis in the Baltimore um, Fair Development Plan for Zero Waste uh, is on addressing um, uh, some of those um, equity issues. Um, but also getting into diversity, inclusion, just environmental justice issues. Uh, uh, they were able to stop the siting of a second major incinerator in Baltimore. Uh, the community uh, was calling for them not to extend the contract um, as part of the zero waste plan for their existing incinerator um, uh, there. Um, the council uh, unanimously supported the zero waste plan but then extended the contract for the incinerator, unfortunately. Um, but the but they also did look at uh, systemic issues like um, uh, vacant lots and vacant uh, buildings, and called for uh, twenty million dollars a year investment in community-based organizations 
um, being funded to buy vacant properties and vacant buildings uh, to um, uh, redevelop those in a, in a positive way. And they have already uh, instituted a fund like that for fair housing, and um, uh, they are uh, trying to replicate that uh, to address some of the, uh, uh, the, the systemic re reasons for uh, the littering and, and, and problems on vacant lots. One of the other things systemically there we found was uh, the illegal dumping was coming from uh, the high eviction rate. Uh, Baltimore had one of the highest eviction rates. And so people and their possessions were, were evicted from buildings and left with nowhere to go. Um, the city had previously uh, provided a warehouse for people's possessions who were evicted, and the Zero Waste Plan called for reinstituting uh, that, that uh, warehouse uh, as one of the tools, but also to get at uh, why is there this high rate of uh, uh, evictions and uh, getting into some of the more systemic issues. And that's what Zero Waste is all about. It's looking at the systems, looking at what not, not uh, the outcomes that are in front of you, but what has caused that, We're getting to the heart of it. That's what rethinking and redesigning is all about. Uh, it, it's trying to figure out what went wrong. Uh, and if we can't fix it with reduce, reuse, recycle, and compost, uh, I say, what would nature do? Nature's, there's no landfills or incinerators in nature. Uh, we've gone billions of years uh, uh, without that in nature. Uh, what we need to do is follow nature and look at uh, what natural principles um, uh, can contribute to solving these problems, which leads to R&D. We need more investment in research and development for innovations in the field. That's where the uh, new billion dollar corporations are gonna come from. That's where the Nobel prizes are gonna come from. Uh, from people innovating. And we, as an industry, need to be in investing more public-private partnerships uh, to develop uh, zero-waste institutes like they've developed at UC Berkeley. Uh, and Boston and uh, Palo Alto zero-waste plans call for the development of uh, to pioneer new innovations. And with this federal money, to work on these innovations is a great time uh, to get your R&D uh, efforts uh, going at the local level. No, it sounds like quite the opportunity there. Um, Natasha, anything you'd want to add on that? No, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Uh, um, well, as a reminder to folks, uh, you're still welcome to use the Q&A function. We have a few more minutes left in the session. We'll take another one here. Um, someone's asking if any examples, uh, good, good examples of glass management in the U.S., given the difficulties of recycling in single stream, are expanded bottle bills the solution? Gary, you mentioned earlier, you know, source separation is a preference of yours, do you see that as the solution for glass, perhaps? Bottle bills are absolutely uh, uh, important and, and a key to uh, successes. We're starting to see a lot more interest in bottle bills in, in states around the United States. Um, uh, the Container Recycling Institute is at the forefront uh, for um, uh, helping uh, the, uh, those new programs be developed. Uh, the Sierra Club National Zero Waste Team that I'm on, um, about two years ago, developed a container redemption um, a guidance um, a document uh, to highlight the importance of uh, bottle bills and uh, for um, how much more uh, they can um, uh, contribute to solving uh, problems, particularly um, with containers and particularly for glass. Um, and on the uh, Sierra Club, uh, they advocate for uh, not including uh, um, those types of containers in producer uh, uh, responsibility legislation, uh, because the bottle bills are better than the uh, than the uh, producer responsibility for packaging legislation is able to create. Uh, it provides the economic incentive we talked about at the beginning of this show. Uh, so um, uh, bottle bills are a key part of it. There's also the Glass Recycling Council and coalition uh, efforts um, um, that have been initiated a lot of uh, by the users of glass, like um, uh, breweries, uh, have been at the forefront. Uh, New Belgium Brewery in, in Colorado and uh, Sierra Nevada Brewery 
or at the forefront of saying, we want to package our product in glass. We've got to figure this out, how to get those containers uh, recycled or, or back to us uh, through uh, redemption systems. Um, so the, uh, um, the Kansas City um, uh, um, examples are, are being highlighted uh, for a good uh, um, uh, drop-off um, uh, systems around uh, urban areas is, is another approach uh, that, that can contribute uh, significantly um, uh, for glass. Uh, taking glass out of the uh, uh, curbside programs isn't the answer. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, we we need to set up um, parallel systems for for um, for glass like the bottle bills uh, that that provide more of an incentive to have people um, uh, source separated and and bring it back. Um. Well, we're toward the end. So I think, you know, this last question we've received is a good forward looking one. So we'll combine this as a, as final thoughts. And the question is, how can the U.S. shift from a waste management industry to a materials management industry? And I think we could ask the same of how city programs can do that as well. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you on that, as well as any final thoughts on what people should watch for next from in, in your respective work. Do you want to start out, Natasha? Sure. Of course, the answer is fun sweep, right? Make us your standard. Yeah. Sweep is the only comprehensive sustainability standard for the solid waste management and zero waste industry. And so we keep presenting our, say, our, our cases that if you fund us, you're helping to fund blanket change and not piecemeal change. Also, it's a holistic approach to decarbonizing the solid waste industry, right? Um, we aim not just... Um, for the profit side, we're looking at people, um, planet, and profit, the triple bottom line. So to even achieve sweep certification, a local government or materials handler must even earn points on like how they're decreasing their carbon emissions by creating efficient uses of energy and water in their facilities, by improving their fuel economy of their collection trucks, by optimizing their collection routes. Also, are they prioritizing the health and safety of their workers and the people that live in the communities around their facilities? Because of all the sweep credits, it's it's actually, um, in fact, I'm someone who works on waste because I am very concerned with climate. And so to work in a space where that's very key and close to the business model and what we're, what this work is about is very important to me. I always like to tell people, I worked in an office of sustainability for six years where climate was very, it was, it was interesting how we all worked in our silos, someone was working on energy, Someone was working on water, I was working on waste, we had urban agriculture, but somehow climate was never really central to the discussions we were having. I don't think I'd noticed that until maybe a year or two ago. But I just love that Sweep is very um, concerned with climate. We are, the, we, are, we are the people that are doing this work because we're concerned about resources coming out of the environment and how we're utilizing them. There was um, a study by um, the Ellen, Arthur, Ellen, Arthur, Ellen MacArthur Foundation that said that so much, um, other than like land conservation and use, so much of the, the talk and the focus of climate and decarbonization comes at the built environment, right? And that's 55% of it. But the other half of that, that other 45% is how we take, make, and dispose of our goods. And until we get a hold of that, until we start doing better with the things that we, uh, um, minings and, 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 and taking out of the planet, um, that that things that took millions of years to make like uh, oil and and plastic bottles and until we start to look at that that piece of it we're we're not going to be solving for the climate crisis in a holistic way and so that's that's my take on it. I, I, I love your emphasis on uh, climate, uh, uh, Natasha. The uh, uh, one tip that I would say is that when communities do uh, climate plans or sustainability plans or resilient plans, whatever. Uh, you're, you're calling them locally. Um, um, if you add one line uh, setting a zero waste goal uh, to address um, reduce, reuse, recycle uh, issues for your community, uh, we found that that's been one of the, um, the best ways to start the journey uh, in a community. Uh, so you do a one or two liner in your climate action plan, your sustainability plan, we we uh, want to achieve zero waste and uh, we need a zero waste plan to get there uh, that leads to then pursuing uh, funding for developing a zero waste plan uh, the zero waste plan uh, sets in motion figuring out 
all the different policies and programs that you have in place already, figuring out uh, what options are out there that you could consider, and then selecting the ones that make the most sense for your community, for your region uh, to pursue. Um, so uh, get a line or two in your climate action plans in your state and MSA ones that we talked about earlier, uh, but also uh, uh, even if you're not doing it for the federal uh, funding, um, uh, do it to uh, uh, guide your programs uh, to move in this uh, journey forward towards zero waste. Great. Well, thank you both for being with us today. And thanks to Be Waste Wise for hosting. Um, I'll kick it back to you, Sweta, for any final notes. Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Natasha. And uh, thank you, Gary. Thanks a lot for your time. Um, uh, as usual, Cole and Waste Dive really put together very interesting uh, webinars uh, for everyone which are US specific. And this is a general note to the audience. We have another webinar coming up, which is going to deal with uh, textile waste at the beginning of July. Please uh, sign, up to our news sign up to our newsletter and you will have updates. And this webinar is recorded. It will go up on our website. We also have additional notes from Gary, which we will add when we publish it uh, on the website in two weeks time. Uh, have a good day, everyone, and bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.